Crawford. I'm the chair of Wellbeing Week in Law, and I'm also the vice president of the new Institute for Wellbeing in Law. In addition to that, I'm also a doctoral student in positive organizational psychology. And for about the past five years, I've been working with a hospital system to develop their resident well-being program. The medical profession has been studying physician well-being and especially burnout for the past few decades. And so they're far ahead of the legal profession in studying well-being. So there may be some things that we can learn in the legal profession about developing our own well-being programs within law firms and other legal organizations. So I thought it would be helpful to share some of my findings and experiences in working with the medical profession. About three years ago, we started a multi-wave study at a large hospital system. And the outcomes we were looking at were engagement, burnout, depression, and also residents' attitudes about returning to their hospital after their residency. The predictor variables that we looked at were first meaningful work, whether the residents experienced their work as meaningful, and also supervisory physicians leadership style. We also looked at something called psychological capital, which is a mental strength made up of four different components, which are hope, efficacy, resilience, and optimism. And what we found is, is that all of these variables had significant relationships with the outcomes that we were studying. I've created two videos to share my experiences working with the hospital system to talk about the development of their resident well-being program and also to share some of our studies findings. In part one, I talked to Dr. Greg Goldner, who is an emergency department physician in Riverside Community Hospital here in Southern California. And I talked with him about his work on developing the elements of the resident well-being program and also some of the findings of our study. In part two, in the second video, I interviewed Dr. Scott Rigby, who is a behavioral scientist who specializes in self-determination theory. This is one of the theories that was the foundation of my book, Positive Professionals, that I wrote for the legal profession. We're now using this same theory as the foundation for a leader training for supervisory physicians. And what our belief is, is that if we're able to improve the effectiveness of the leadership style of supervisory physicians, we'll be able to increase the well being of the residents that they supervise. Each video is only about 30 minutes long, and I hope you find them helpful. Hi, Scott. Thanks so much Hi. for joining me today. I'm it's great so to be here. I'm so excited to, to get to talk about one of our joint, jointly favorite topics of self-determination theory. Scott, the way that I got introduced to you is that I've been working on uh, a resident well-being study for a couple of years with a large hospital organization. And we've been looking at things that are associated with burnout and engagement. And one of the things that we found in our study is that autonomy supportive or need supportive leadership, leaders that support self-determination theory needs really had a, had a significant association with both of those things, negatively associated with burnout and positively associated with engagement. So of course we reached out to you, one of the experts in need supportive leadership. Can you just give a nutshell of self-determination theory? What, what is this? Self-determination theory is really a theory about human flourishing. It, it is a theory about human well-being. Um, and so the purpose of self-determination theory is to help us uh, get a blueprint or understand what are the experiences that uh, we need to have as human beings that allow us to feel a sense of, uh, of flourishing, of true fulfillment. Sure, that means kind of happiness and satisfaction. But even beyond just those fleeting emotions is, are we really kind of substantially getting our needs met? In self-determination theory, there are three very clear basic psychological needs that are outlined. There's the need for competence or mastery, that sense of feeling effective and successful at what you're doing, uh, and also feeling a sense of growth. Uh, you mentioned autonomy support. Autonomy is that sense of uh, a volition in what one's doing, uh, that what you're about, you really feel like you're the author, you endorse it. I want to be, uh, I, I want to be the author of my life. I want to be an individual person that gets to express who I am 
and live in accordance with my values, both in and out of work. The third basic need is a need for relatedness. Relatedness is that uh, desire we all have, that need we have to really matter to one another. I matter to you and you matter to me, and that we're supportive of each other out of a sense of uh, inclusion and respect. Uh, Once we have that blueprint, we then look at what is the environment doing around us that, are, that includes our relationships, it includes our work, and includes uh, politics, circumstances, whatever it might be. How is that environment either facilitating the fulfillment of those needs and, uh, and our thriving, or what is the environment doing that might be thwarting or suppressing our ability to have that fulfillment and those needs. So I'll talk a bit about motivational quality. When most people think about motivation, they think about it as kind of a binary state. So you either have more motivation or less motivation. Every time I see an employee experience survey, if there's a motivational item, people say, oh yeah, we measure motivation. And then you'll see, you know, how motivated are you, right, on this kind of slider. What we know from self-determination theory is that's not the way motivation works. There's actually multiple flavors or kinds of motivation that are all operating simultaneously. And you can arrange those along a continuum of quality. And if I'm not giving people or facilitating high quality motivation, and instead they're motivated by low quality motivation, and I'll talk about what each of those is in a moment, then even if people are, have their heads down and they're doing the work, those with low quality motivation are going to burn out. They're going to do poor quality work, and overall, the outcomes are going to be uh, suboptimal. Low quality motivation is motivation that comes from some kind of pressure, right? I feel external pressure. There's a deadline. There's a threat and punishment. I have to imagine that this is uh, a pretty common phenomena, right, in law firms, and that it's even that kind of pressure cooker approach is, is probably... Uh, the lower you are in the food chain, probably the more of that there is going on. Uh, then there's internal pressure. That's pressure I'm putting on myself. If I, it, am I doing this so that, will I look good in the way I'm doing this? Uh, I, if I don't do this, I'm going to feel guilty or I'm going to be ashamed or I'm going to be, so there's all these internal pressures that people on, put on themselves. And those pressures can be very motivating. And I suspect that in a lot of law firms, that is what's driving a lot of that behavior. Um, the problem is that uh, over time, again, that's going to lead to burnout and poor quality work. High quality motivation, on the other hand, is when you're motivated out of, out of a sense of, number one, I personally value what I'm working on right now. You might not even have to like it, right? I bet there's a lot of things in law firms, like every job, that are not that pleasant. But if, like, you know, if you say to yourself, I am doing this and I really, I really value the purpose of this. I value where it's moving me. I, 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 I think I'm learning a new skill or uh, this experience is something that I value overall, even if this task is unpleasant. That kind of motivation is going to um, be uh, much higher quality. You're going to see better outcomes. You're going to see less burnout. And then, of course, the highest form of motivational quality is intrinsic, which is just those parts of one's job that are just enjoyable, that people really, really you know, enjoy doing. And so as a supervisor, the reason I went through that whole continuum is you want to be doing the things that foster those higher quality forms of motivation and attenuate those lower quality forms of motivation. So you're building that high motivational quality. And Anne, not surprisingly, it turns out the way to do that is need support. Right? By focusing on needs, you're going to help people move towards those higher motivational quality states. And that's going to get you, by the way, on a practical level, better work output. That's going to get you better ownership, right? So you have this question all the time of how do you build more ownership? How can I get people to take more ownership of their work, right? This is the way. High quality motivation is the way for people to take ownership of their work. So in the long run, by investing in these need supports, you're going to build more successful, uh, better quality work. Um, and you're going to get the very thing that most supervisors uh, feel is this, uh, you know, kind of elusive goal in the people that they're managing. I know from my own studies that there are so many leadership theories out there. Yeah. What is need supportive leadership and how is it different? By focusing on those needs and first of all, getting people to understand those basic needs. 
uh, you really give leaders a toolkit that they can apply broadly across their teams, no matter how big or small those teams, no matter where those teams are located, because those, those needs are fundamental and they're universal. And so when you're training leaders in those needs, if you give them those needs, they now have kind of like a, a skeleton key, right? They, they, have, they have something that they can apply in every situation to every type of person. And um, by training specifically in how to support those needs, you're able to give them that toolkit. So you're not just saying to them, you need to have more regular contact with your direct reports, or you need to show more empathy. You're actually giving the toolkit for what that means. What am I doing when I meet with my direct reports regularly? Well, I'm checking in with them around these basic needs so that I can give them the support that they need. And so um, it's very action oriented as well as being universal, which is, a, which is a terrific combination. And what consistently is found is that when leaders focus on these basic uh, needs, when they're supportive of these needs, this is sort of what you found in your study, um, you see it's sort of the tide that raises all boats. So you see benefits both to the individual. So that would involve things like well-being, uh, productivity. Um, you, see, you see both increases in the positive things, such as those things, as well as decreases in the negative things. So you see less absenteeism. You see less healthcare utilization. Uh, so you see less mental and physical symptomology, which of course is very much related to the ideas of burnout and being overworked. Um, and then what's great for the leaders that are needing to both manage the needs and care for their people, but also care for their organization, is that you also see benefits to the bottom line. So you're, you're going to see more productivity, uh, even more profitability is, is uh, being shown in a lot of studies. And so by really focusing on these need supports, uh, you're not making this trade-off between Getting, getting what you need out of people transactionally to make the business succeed, but at their expense or going the other way and, and seeing taking care of people as a cost factor that's kind of a necessary evil, but takes away from the business. These things are very synergistic and everything benefits. Yeah, and let's just, let's build on that. Let's get really practical. You know, what law firms are really looking for are practical ways, practical things that they can bring into their environments to help yeah. boost well-being along with, you know, performance, engagement, all these things that we care about. So do you have some real, very practical strategies that lawyers and others in legal organizations can start using tomorrow uh, to get some of these benefits? One of the things that I, I think the transactionality that we I continuously see um, in the relationship that goes on between a supervisor and a team member um, is something that I would say requires people day to day to step back from and to think about differently. Uh, and there are practical ways to do that. So what do I mean by transactionality? Well, it just means you're here to get this job done for me. And in the legal world, my understanding is I need to have billable hours. <laughs> I need to get X amount of billable hours out of myself and out of my team. Uh, my friends who are lawyers talk about the fact that there are, you know, goals and targets and priorities when they're coming up for bonuses, because those are the things that are measured. Guess what? What's get, what's get, what gets measured gets optimized. And so teams and supervisors are going to think about this and they're going to focus on this. Here's the problem is what we know from the research is that when you focus on that transactionality, that you tend to, uh, operate and supervise in ways that manage to that goal, but begin to thwart or not support basic needs. If you're thinking about these needs as your primary thing, that's going to naturally lead you purposefully into the kinds of behaviors you need to have with your team in order to really support them. What I mean by that is a lot of managers are walking around being told, hey, remember to have a weekly, you got to reach out to your team more. You need to have a weekly meeting. You need to have these kind of contacts. And so we get into this tactical layer of contact, but what am I supposed to do? Like, I'll, let's come back to the theory itself as a manager or supervisor, why am I doing that? What's the purpose for doing that? Is it just people need human contact? Well, that's not, that doesn't have a high enough resolution. What people need is need support and that comes from human contact. But if I'm focusing on needs, 
if I think about mastery for a minute, if I'm really making sure that the day-to-day -day workload is okay for somebody, that they're feeling effective and successful, they have the tools and the scaffolding they need, that's going to lead me into a conversation with somebody. That's going to lead me to reach out to them, right? In, in the autonomy domain, it's like I want everyone to have a sense of purpose or volition. So I'm in my weekly meeting, and I'm keeping autonomy in mind as I'm having that meeting. That's going to naturally lead me to take a few extra minutes. And I really mean minutes here. Here's the thing about this is I get tired of managers and supervisors. I don't get tired of it. Maybe I get a little tired of it. Who are like, well, oh, there's no time for this. There's no time for this. And it, it takes an extra 60 seconds, 90 seconds, two minutes when you're talking about something to say, let me talk for a minute about why this is so important. Let me tell you about why I think I have a sense of purpose for this and personalize it. In other words, take a beat to make sure you understand that purpose and why, and then communicate that to the team. Take five minutes to let people talk about their concerns so that you can kind of address and help people move towards purpose, right? We're focusing on autonomy, um, when I have that conversation with you, Anne, as your supervisor, I'm going to be mainly listening to what you're saying. <laughs> I'm going to be listening to what dynamics, uh, what needs, what concerns, what emotions are particular to you. And the reason I'm going to be doing that is that's the way that I'm going to be supporting your autonomy. That's the only path that I'm going to be able to take, really, to support you finding that sense of purpose. In practice, this is what we see uh, good intuitive managers doing all the time. Right. They're, they're listening twice as long as they're talking, if not 10 times as long as they're talking. And they're having an authentic, very present, very mindful conversation with somebody and trying to understand how they can be uh, supporting these basic needs. And that's always a very individualistic process. That's sort of why it's called self-determination theory. By thinking about this in the autonomy domain, as you're going into those meetings, again, you're very naturally going to do things that um, do the tactics, but you'll understand the purpose and it'll be integrated. And by the way, as we've already talked about, that's going to lead to people feeling more connected, more heard, more trustful. And so you're going to have that kind of tide that raises all boats. There's kinds of things that lawyers do that they don't necessarily, you know, doesn't necessarily align with their values. Um, yeah. And so they then think that they're it's not really for them that feeling a sense of meaningfulness and purpose is probably not going to be part of their work because they work on these kinds of cases. How, how would you respond to that? Well, first of all, I would say that I, I would not, uh, uh, I would say that's, it's a challenging situation, right? So the, the first thing is um, if I feel like my work and the output of my work is something that I cannot connect with, uh, that is going to be problematic long-term for motivation and for well-being. So the, the question is, um, what can I connect to that has purpose, right? And so uh, as a supervisor, you want to do a couple of things. Uh, the first is you don't want to shy away from asking these questions. So a lot of times uh, I think if it's the unspoken elephant in the room is this, this, this cause feels a little bit like we're working for the bad guys or whatever it might be to be like, well, let's just get put our heads down and get this work done. But as we've talked about already, and that that's just going to foster to cut off the ability to find some purpose and connect is going to foster more of that sense of control and low quality forms of motivation. So the first thing is open up the floor to that conversation, right? Invite that conversation. How do people feel now? You might hear a lot of things that have two qualities to them. One, they're exactly what you expected. People are not feeling good about things. People don't relate to them. People have moral qualms, ethical qualms, whatever it might be, right? Uh, and second, the second thing might be, there's nothing I can do about this. This is a client. We've taken on this work and we have a responsibility to do it. And a lot of times, that's, and I acknowledge that second thing is true. And a lot of times, because that second thing is true, you don't even want to start the conversation. But the key in this situation is uh, to let those feelings come out 
and then just acknowledge them. You don't have to solve them. You don't have to make them go away. Acknowledge them. Let people have their feelings. Acknowledge those feelings are valid. Acknowledge it can often be difficult to do work in light of those things. And then have the conversation about why we're doing it. And there needs to be a why in that conversation. But as a supervisor, it's really not losing track of that yourself. You need to find the thing that you authentically believe in around this that you can communicate to the team. And I think it's important to go through that process and it allows, it allows you to find, to find that sense of purpose and to, let peop- and to give voice uh, in the room to whatever the concerns are. And even if that still means at the end of that conversation and that process, everybody still has to kind of put their head down and bite the bullet, whatever other metaphors you want to put in here and do a lot of unpleasant things. The work is the same. The experience of need support is going to be stronger. And as a result of that, the engagement is going to be better and well-being will be better. You, you also mentioned kind of looking for purpose in a variety of ways. And so potentially my values don't align, but there might be a way of reframing it where they do align. Like I, I'm serving yeah. the, the greater good of the legal profession. But there's also yeah. like thinking about the other needs of like relationships and growing mastery. Are those are kind of things too. Like if you, if, yeah. if the value is a bit out of alignment of thinking, but I'm, but this client I care about, this person uh, yeah. that, that I'm working for, I care about, uh, or I, I get some really great experience. Uh, yeah. Or what aspect of the case. So I can imagine you very saying, so, you know, I hear all that. I hear how this cause is something that really runs against your personal values. Or Let's talk about what elements of this have some interest to you, maybe just in the processes or the type of case it is, or, you know, in other words, what's happening, this, I'm just riffing on your point here, Anne, about experience. I think that's a great goal is to move into that and acknowledge those pieces of it. At the same time, I think uh, the two need to go hand in hand, because if you don't acknowledge those negative things, then you look like you're in a, a big rationalization game. So it's kind of acknowledging what's in the room while also trying to find those implicit points of purpose. I think that's a yeah. great strategy. It's, it's such a good point because historically what has happened is that we don't talk about it and we don't learn in law school how to grapple with it. And so yeah. it ends up, you know, like you're suggesting, it's sort of suppressed and that doesn't make it go away. Um, yeah. But the act of acknowledging it and talking about it can can improve the experience. uh, It can improve it. Absolutely. And it takes away that pressure and it takes away, you know, when you think about these, these issues of burnout and well-being, like there's so much that is grinding away at all of us all the time, you know, in, in our work and we we're carrying around all these worries and everything else. And so, you know, this kind of an approach helps to, uh, to release what's releasable, right? There may still, you know, there may be still be issues there that people have to be mindful of and work through, but at least you're creating a better climate for well-being in, in that instance. You're doing, you're doing what you can to take care of people in that circumstance. Uh, and you mentioned burnout. So <laughs> let's move to that. Uh, yeah. Oddly, we haven't yet had um, a large scale or any scale burnout study of lawyers in the U.S., but we yeah. often use that term of lawyers have high rates of burnout. I think what people really mean is that the work is exhausting um, mm-hmm. and challenging and we're always on and especially, and that's always true, but during the pandemic, it's reached what a lot of you know, critics and, and people watching the legal industry have called, you know, it's reaching crisis level. Self-determination theory offer any strategies for that of addressing head-on this potential burnout crisis? Uh, you know, self-determination theory is itself a model for wellness. You know, a lot of times self-determination theory gets talked about as well. This is an engagement model or a motivational model, but it, at its heart, its soul, is it's a well-being model. And so it just so happens uh, that when you focus on people's well-being, you see all these other things emerge. You see engagement emerge. You see vitality emerge. You know, uh, in self-determination theory, 
the concept we have for talking about that's very relevant to burnout is this notion of vitality, what we call subjective vitality in the literature. And this is that sense of really that usable energy that you have uh, in order to engage in your life and the things that you're doing. And once again, we see that that experience of vitality uh, is very much related to how well you feel your needs are being fulfilled and how well you feel that your needs are being supported. And so um, I, I think this focus on need support uh, is, is going to be uh, uh, not just critical for thinking about issues of engagement, but also uh, to dealing with the issues of burnout. We, we did a uh, we did some work with a large healthcare company through the last year of the pandemic. And one of the things uh, we had actually done a, a major organizational assessment of their climate uh, in uh, 2019 before the pandemic hit. It went through the whole pandemic and then we did in the fall of 2020 another assessment. And what was really remarkable is we found in that data that although not surprisingly, vitality did take a drop over that pandemic year across their workforce. Uh, it was remarkably small and it was this incredible protective factor of need support and fulfillment. So the work that that organization had been doing uh, really helped to inoculate, if you will, uh, against a lot of the ill effects that you might have expected during that pandemic time. Um, um, one thing though I wanna say, I wanna come back to this notion of transactionality is I think the key to making this all work in is that we can't see what I'm talking about as a tactic. Uh, so in other words, okay, I get that we need to have lawyers, law firms need fresh talent into their pipeline. We need to have an, an HR, which HR of course stands for human resources. Like the very name of the field is that these people are resources to be used. And you know, we think we talk about talent acquisition and talent retention, and everything is framed in terms of the organization. And the organization is this monolith that sits there, and then the people are just kind of in orbit around this whole thing. Self-determination theory turns all that on its head. So you know what? If you don't start to fundamentally focus on the well-being of the person, not because of what you need to get out of them, then you're never going to be able to really unlock the very thing that you want for your organization, the very thing you want for your culture, uh, a culture of thriving, inclusion, uh, authenticity, hard work, all that's only, only going to come when you stop trying to go after it directly and you start authentically caring about the people and then watching it emerge. I would challenge all leaders to get into a mindset of, I need to make my first goal authentically caring for my people not caring for my people so that I'll have retention or so that I'll have engagement or so that I can compete with the other law firm across town that's trying to hire them. I need to just care for my people. And what I would say to you is that's not Pollyanna. The data shows that that's the best way to get uh, the results that you want from your organization as well as to address these burnout issues. All right, Scott, thank you so much uh, for your insights on self-determination theory and how the legal profession can start using these really practical strategies every day to improve well-being in the profession. Thanks so much. Oh, it's been great being here, Anne.